tens of millions of families with Alzheimer's disease and dementia all over the world, including our family. We are Alls in the Fam. I'm Alan Fair. And I'm Polly Fair Noyes. We're siblings, we are parents, but we're also caregivers. This is our podcast. This is our support group. Welcome to our family. Alzheimer's sucks, but this family lives, laughs, and learns as we fight for a cure. Welcome. Hey, Polly. Hey, Alan. So it's been a heavy week for our family. Um, just we'll just dive, we'll dive right in. Um, my son Marcos, who's ten, woke up on Thursday, Wednesday actually, not feeling well, and he ended up having uh, appendicitis. Was diagnosed, had to take him to NYU hospital. It's uh, May 17th, so at the time of this recording, New York City is famous for many things, and certainly the coronavirus outbreak is one of them. So um, we had to take him to NYU to get his appendix out. He's home safe and recovering, but wow, um, I'm sure everyone probably at some point has maybe thought in the back of their mind, I sure hope I don't have to go to the hospital myself during this pandemic. I know I certainly did, and we went. And we had a really great experience. The people at NYU were absolutely wonderful. Um, I mean, it was a horrific experience, of course, because I love my son and didn't want to see him in, in pain. But the doctors were great. The nurses were great. The entire healthcare system that I saw and experienced was great. So while there's a lot of tough things happening in New York right now. NYU Hospital is doing some some wonderful things and I can report that other um, patients are getting the help that they need as well. Yeah, so we really that, had a, a good outcome from a really scary situation. Thank you and, and he's doing great. And while I don't wanna minimize him or his recovery at the end of the day, he's a 10 year old with uh, his appendix out and he's recovering fine. More heavily, though, we had a double whammy of a week where we also found out that our mom, Carmen, has tested positive for COVID-19. Yeah, so I got a call from the, um, her assisted living facility, her memory care facility, late last week, and they said, we're going to test everyone in the facility. We've had a couple cases, maybe four and uh, we're going to test her on Monday. Do you have our permission? And I was like, sure, it's a good idea. So they um, tested her on Monday. And on Wednesday, they called and said, your mom tested positive for coronavirus. Um, I knew from the staff there that she had no um, symptoms at all, other than being tired, which like a lot of Alzheimer's um, people living with Alzheimer's, she's kind of has her night and day mixed up. So she sleeps until noon often. Um, and uh, it didn't seem, that was not out of the ordinary. She didn't have a fever, didn't have a cough, didn't have um, anything else. But um, so we were encouraged by that. On Thursday, she didn't really eat much. Um, and that was a cause for concern. She didn't want to drink or eat much. And um, so Friday, when she woke up at like noon, the, um, the person in charge of her floor, wonderful person, great care, um, she was concerned because mom again didn't want to eat and she usually likes her coffee in the morning and her breakfast and fruit and um, refused all food and water and um, wasn't, just didn't seem herself and had a rash, rash on her face. So anyway, she called 911. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, long story short, the paramedics came. They were wonderful. Mom walked over to them and said, I'm fine. They took her pulse. They used a pulse oximeter to test her oxygen saturation and uh, among other things, but it was at 98%, which is perfect, good. So um, she, they offered to take her to the hospital and she refused, which I'm sure glad she did because... Um, this brings up, Alan, what we were talking about, how difficult it is now in a time of COVID to um, 
send someone with Alzheimer's to the hospital. They don't know why they're going or anything, and they can't have anyone with them. They terrifying, go, terrifying imagining our mother or really any person with Alzheimer's at the hospital during this time, having no idea or remembering why they are there and specifically with regard to in the time of COVID, their family members cannot go there right. and be with them. Not at all. A horrific combination that has really made us rethink some things about her planning. Yeah. So uh, that brings up, you know, the one thing we really don't have a lot of time today to give our normal longer podcast, but we wanted to share with you one of the things we were really thankful for, and that is that we, a lo- quite a while ago, um, sat down with my mom's doctor and filled out advanced care directives and orders for life-sustaining treatment. Um, so those can be found most states, I think 46 out of 50 states in the United States anyway, have websites where you can go and download a form for that specific state that says your wishes if you should get really sick. Um, so mom had those on, um, they were on file at her care facility. Her doctor has a copy of it. Um, and I was reminded that I read the book, um, Being Mortal by Atul Gawanda. I really hope I've said that cor- correctly. I know it's a hard name to pronounce, but <laughs> um, it's called Being Mortal. Mm-hmm. And we highly recommend it for anyone who finds themselves in a similar situation to ours or is interested in um, just rethinking and rewiring for how they think about death in general, but specifically planning for the death of a loved one as well as for oneself. Yeah. I mean, the the subtitle of the book is Medicine and What Matters in the End. And I think if you have a loved one with Alzheimer's or and just someone who's getting older, really any age, you, what matters in the end, you really need to think about it now. Don't wait till the end. Um, so uh, to bring it back, we, um, we already have one of these in place. But what was really important is we needed to, I realized when they called an ambulance for my mom simply because um, she was kind of lethargic and didn't want to eat, I realized that I needed to think about what her um, orders for life-sustaining treatment said. So um, when mom was first diagnosed with coronavirus, the first thing the care facility did was call her doctor, her primary care physician, and tell her. And the doctor said, okay, well, watch her. If she gets worse, take her to the hospital. Because the doctor knows that's what mom's uh, orders for life-sustaining treatment say. And... um, Again, we couldn't envision what things would be like in a time of coronavirus. So um, we're going to take a look at that now and think about when would be appropriate um, for mom to go to the hospital. Certainly not because she has a rash, I don't think. Um, Oh, also an aside I should have mentioned before. She also told the paramedics the reason she wasn't eating is because she couldn't taste anything which was the first actual symptom of coronavirus we'd seen from her. (laughs) The rash she had, by the way, we also had a doctor look at and was not a coronavirus type rash. Um, Anyway, so um, I thought I'd just briefly talk with you, Alan, about, I think you have a copy of mom's orders for life-sustaining treatment. Everyone in our family does, but... um, I do. I have mine right here. All right. So there's a fun document. Let me tell you. Yeah. Well, it's actually, uh, you know, I I was lucky enough to sit with mom and together we talked to the doctor about it. And um, similar to Atul Gawande's father, when he talked to him about his end of life, what he wanted, his, his father was very clear. Mom was very clear about what she wants. Um, what, what her wishes were, which really helped me and will guide me always. And it can take a lot of guilt away from you. And those are hard decisions to make. I mean, it they could are. be that even among a family as close as ours, Alan, one of us might think things should happen one way and one might think another way. Um, right. And just as you helped mom with hers, I helped our father with right. his. And 
just to tie it back to this this book by Atul Gawande, whose name we hope that we're pronouncing correctly, one of the things that book really did for me is that it helped me think about this push pull of wanting to give your parents what they need and then what you reflexively think that they want and need. So dad didn't want to be resuscitated either. And I remember thinking, that's crazy. Of course you want to be resuscitated. Of course you want to survive. And what I realized as he got sicker and over time was that, no, he didn't want that at all. He wanted to ride out the end of his life with as much dignity and independence as possible. And if he was going to go out and have a uh, heart disease um, and have a heart attack and die, that's the way he wanted to go out. He didn't want to get taken to the hospital and hooked up to tubes to survive a little longer. He wanted to ride out his life with as much independence as possible. And I remember just thinking, God, what a, what a cynical thing. And as you get older, um, and, and what this book talks about is starting to think about death differently so that when that unfortunate time comes, and it does come for all of us, our, our bodies age, our arteries harden, our brain shrinks and gives us dementia and, and Alzheimer's. Accidents. Anything could happen. You know, you, you have to be careful um, for what you wish for and what you articulate to your children or loved ones who are going to help you with that. Because I know for me, I started out coming from a place, well, I want to live as long as I possibly can, but I actually don't want to spend my final two years on a ventilator or, and I don't, I don't know how long people live when they're on a ventilator, but my, my point is that um, I want to rethink my final years and don't want to suffer through just so I can reach an extra birthday. Yeah, I think it's all about quality of life, not quantity of life. Nobody wants to live, you know, two years longer in extreme pain or two years longer, you know, uh, tied to a ventilator. I mean, I, I don't. Maybe there are people that do, and that's okay as long as the person has, I mean, this is my only um, idea is that people really want to ask their parents while they can or their loved ones how, how do you want your life to be in the end? Um, and then the other thing in, uh, that's on a uh, order for life-sustaining treatment is the hospital transfer portion. And that's really important in mom's case. It wasn't for dad. Dad, I know, refused being transported to the hospital a couple of times as well. And, um, you know, he still had, uh, he, well, he did not have dementia, let's say. So he, and he was still able to think clearly at that time. Um, but in the time of COVID-19, I think that's one of the parts I need to look at for mom because I don't want her transferred to the hospital alone. I do want her kept comfortable. And that I, you know, there's a lot of things that can be done without being in a hospital to keep someone comfortable nowadays. Um, so we really learned this week that these uh, orders for life-sustaining treatments, you don't do it once. And, and it, it's something that's off the list in terms yeah. of being a caregiver as the world changes. And the world has certainly changed in the face of COVID-19. Here we are reevaluating something. Yeah. Like I mean, the, these orders were so carefully written to make sure they covered a lot of situations, but nobody knew about COVID-19. So, you know, the other thing is we're going to put some stuff in the show notes, Alan, for people um, there's one good article I read. It was an op-ed in the New York Times written by a doctor about what it's like if you're on, an, on a ventilator. And that really helped me. And I'm sure it would have helped you like with dad when he was making sort of decisions for himself um, to read that article because it explained perhaps the, the outcome after being on a ventilator and what that can mean for even a young person. Right. Um, so we'll put that in the show notes. We'll put a link to um, the Pulsed website, which is um, P-O-L-S-T. It is a every state, just about every state in the United States. Um, there's a link from that website to their life-sustaining orders, just a form you can fill out and get your doctor to sign. 
Um, and we'll put a link for Atul Gawande's book, Being Mortal, because we just think that's fabulous. Um, we do. And I, we had a different episode planned to deploy this week as our next episode. And so in finding out this news, we thought it would be more appropriate to share something that's, that's timely. So for all of us out there, all of us caregivers and all of us now dealing with being a caregiver in the time of COVID-19, um, let us offer a lot of uh, love and solidarity to everyone. And perhaps we'll be revisiting this topic more. We'll keep our listeners posted as to our journey, not only with our mother having Alzheimer's, but also in whatever comes next with this COVID-19 diagnosis. Yeah, uh, we should just say uh, mom today is doing pretty good. She's eating and she's rash is gone. I don't know if she can taste anything, but she's eating. So that's good. She's walking around. Yeah. After the week that we've been through, mostly what I'm able to focus on is just being grateful, grateful that we have each other, grateful that even if she has this diagnosis outside of her normal symptoms of having Alzheimer's, it still just seems like she only has Alzheimer's. So. Right. <laughs> well, so far she doesn't have a lot of other symptoms, but I'll tell you, it really spread quickly through her nursing home, like the stories you're hearing up in New York, New Jersey, but here in Maryland as well. Uh, you know, there were four people that had the virus one week and the next week it was 30. So, um, one week feels like a lifetime these days. Yeah. I mean, I FaceTimed with mom maybe a week or 10 days ago, and it was just the same circular conversation that I've grown so accustomed to over the years. Yeah. Complained about the weather, the sky was a uh, slate gray. How are the how are the kids? Tell them I love them. And then how is the weather? <laughs> the sky <laughs> is slate gray. Tell the kids I love them. And right. That's asking about Tina usually. I'm guessing, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And here we are now. So she'd probably still say the same thing because she probably doesn't even know that she has it and she isn't very... I talked to her for a while yesterday. And uh, actually, I read some breathing exercises that um, I guess a nurse somewhere had talked about and uh, her had posted a video of that J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter books, had she had put a link to them. And so I was talking to mom about them and she was actually doing them on the phone with me. So. Oh, cool. She won't remember to do them after we hang up, but it was, it was just fascinating her desire to keep trying to be healthy. So it's really. That's probably what's going to help her, even though she has this COVID-19 virus in her. Is that other than her Alzheimer's and dementia, she's quite healthy. Very healthy. Bodily yeah. speaking. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, Alan, I think we can sign off. You can get back to looking after your son, his poor appendicitis. Yep. Yeah, I'm getting a look at those bandages and see what's going on with him. Probably a lot of Minecraft playing and talking yes. with his buds <laughs> on, the, uh, yeah. on the iPad. So, all good. We're, all right. we're lucky. Nice to yeah. be with you, Polly. Yeah. Same, Alan. Live, you know, everyone out there, our thoughts are with you and keep fighting. Bye. Nice together. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to All's in the Fam. In the fight against Alzheimer's and dementia, we are all family. Find us at All's in the Fam on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and on our website, All's in the Fam Podcast.com. We appreciate you clicking that subscribe button on Apple, Google, Spotify, or whatever your favorite podcast catcher may be. Alzheimer's sucks, but we are in it together. We are Alls in the Family. Talk soon.